The symptoms associated with follicular lymphoma can be vast or heterogeneous, but oftentimes there are no symptoms associated with follicular lymphoma. So what do we mean by that? Oftentimes patients will have an incidental finding of an enlarged lymph node. Either they're having an imaging study done for another health reason, or as this patient presents to her primary care physician with a palpable lymph node that's often painless and can be stable in size or may be growing, can be quite heterogeneous in presentation. The symptoms we often will ask about when we're trying to discern whether or not there's an aggressive feature to the follicular lymphoma are the traditional B symptoms associated with lymphoma, such as weight loss. We generally will use a cutoff of 10% of their dry weight or more. Night sweats, we generally look to see if those are drenching or occurring more than three times per week. Fatigue, which is oftentimes subjective, but if it's impacting their quality of life or daily routine, or even their functional status, we find that to be very valuable and associated with their lymphoma. Um, and fever in the absence of an infection that might otherwise explain it. Patients will oftentimes grow frustrated when we routinely ask about these symptoms and they oftentimes do not have them. But I still think it's valuable to at least address these questions during each visit or each treatment assessment. Follicular lymphoma is our most common low-grade B-cell lymphoma, and oftentimes patients will come into our clinic and know they have a diagnosis of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but do not further differentiate or understand that there are various subtypes of lymphoma that are probably very important to discern because it has implications for how we treat and what their outcomes are. The most common phenotype of follicular lymphoma is based on their flow cytometry or immunohistochemistry in that it's a B-cell lineage, so it's often traditionally CD20 positive, CD10 positive. It is hard to distinguish follicular lymphoma from a large cell that's a germinal center derivation just based on flow cytometry or immunohistochemistry. So oftentimes I will advocate that an FNA is an inadequate uh, diagnostic approach for these patients. And oftentimes that's their first um, diagnostic approach, meaning they'll have an FNA that's ordered by a primary care physician or an ENT physician to discern what type of cancer it is. And for instance, this patient presenting with axillary adenopathy, breast cancer would have been on the list of differentials. And so it's not uncommon for us to see a patient come in with an FNA. And we know that there's a B cell clone, but we can't distinguish between say a large cell lymphoma or even a Burkitt, which may have a similar phenotype. So I do advocate that an excisional biopsy, particularly at diagnosis, is incredibly important. So you can have the morphology to help distinguish between which type of B-cell lymphoma you're dealing with. And also looking at the grading of the follicular lymphoma, which even though this is quite controversial and oftentimes pathologists will disagree, it's still pertinent information. I would say in the United States, we tend to put more emphasis on grade than European countries, meaning we still are giving more anthracyclines to grade three follicular lymphoma based on retrospective data suggests they do well. And we're waiting on prospective data to tell us whether or not bendamustine and rituximab or bendamustine and CD20 antibody is appropriate therapy for patients with grade three follicular lymphoma. Those prospective studies have completed enrollment, but we don't know the results yet. So morphology is still very important in this disease and is helpful in distinguishing the type of lymphoma that will have treatment implications. The other things that you have to consider when you're looking at a new diagnosis is whether or not there is an underlying concomitant or concordant lymphoma, meaning two lymphomas at the same time. About 10% of the time, and we're uh, an institution that sees quite a bit of follicular lymphoma, it's not that infrequent for us to see both a diagnosis of follicular and large cell as their initial diagnosis. We do know that about 30% of patients with follicular lymphoma will ultimately transform at some point in their disease course, meaning they develop more aggressive features and histologically it's more consistent with large cell lymphoma. But there's also about 10% of patients at diagnosis that will have both follicular and large cell lymphoma. And again, this is where an excisional biopsy is very meaningful to help distinguish out those patients. We're not currently clear as to whether or not those patients do as poorly as the traditional patients who transform, meaning they have a pre-existing diagnosis of follicular lymphoma and then later develop the histologic transformation that has been historically associated with poor outcomes, but it's still something that's important to tease out. Occasionally, you'll have a follicular lymphoma that's also negative for the translocation 1418. I think it's very important to have a good excisional biopsy to ensure that you are confident about the diagnosis of follicular lymphoma. There is a growing trend to pursue more needle biopsies for patients with a new diagnosis or 
initial presentation with lymphadenopathy. And though this is more convenient for patients and oftentimes for physicians, I feel that this is a growing trend that may have implications for how confident we are in the diagnosis and secondly, how we manage these patients, meaning are we confident about the grading, are we confident that there is only one lymphoma present at the initial presentation. An FNA will clearly determine whether or not there is a malignant clone present and decide the T or B cell lineage, but it will not render a complete diagnosis. You may get as far as knowing whether it's a germinal center or follicle center lymphoma, but again, it's not a definitive diagnosis. And there leaves some ambiguity whether or not this is a large cell or follicular, which again, the treatment management may be vastly different. So that is valuable information to know. Corneal biopsies can give more information than an FNA because generally you will have some morphology to examine, but our pathologists oftentimes remind us that those are often very limited samples that are impacted by crush or processing artifacts that make their jobs very challenging. However, there are situations where corneal biopsy is the only appropriate approach for a patient, meaning if you have a retroperitoneal lymph node or a mesenteric node that is not easily obtained outside of a large surgical exploration. So in these situations, we're oftentimes relying on a core needle biopsy as our original or initial diagnosis. Uh, again, there are limitations for this, and our pathologists will often describe those limitations in the pathologic um, diagnosis, but this may be our only option.